Returning then this morning to the first letter to the Corinthians. The first letter to the Corinthians, <coughs> chapter 3. First Corinthians, chapter 3. You've got the four Gospels in Acts, Romans and Corinthians. we're reading just a few verses beginning at verse 1 <coughs> and I brethren could not speak unto you as unto spiritual but as unto carnal even as unto babes in Christ I have fed you with milk and not with meat for hitherto ye were not able to bear it neither yet now are ye able for ye are yet carnal for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now that he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labour. That's just... Okay, so we're looking then um, at this first few verses of 1 Corinthians 3 today. Now I'm not going to expound here, um, but just take a theme, a theme in fact which I uh, found in John Phillips' Uh, yesterday and uh, thought perhaps it was the right place to go this morning so uh, my points really are from John Phillips's guide but much of the substance is my own so we've read these first few verses here 1 Corinthians 3 and I want to just point out to you this morning from this chapter and other portions of scripture seven marks of spiritual babyhood what it is to be a spiritual baby and how we might identify our condition before the Lord. Not just that we might look at others and identify their condition, but more importantly that we might look at ourselves and identify our own. So easy, Spurgeon used to warn his people about listening to the message in somebody else's ears. And uh, you know, we need to understand. You remember when the Lord Jesus said, Who do men say that I am? It was a general broad question first of all. They said, some say Elias, some say one of the prophets. And then he says, but who say ye that I am? It always gets personal. And uh, the word of God needs to be personal for all of us. Now there's three types of person mentioned uh, in the closing verses of chapter 2 and the opening verse uh, of chapter 3 here. Uh, look with me back to chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. So we have mention of the natural man here at the end of chapter 2. And then in chapter 3 we, we read together, I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. So we have three types of character. One of them is a lost man. Two of them are saved men. The lost man is the natural man. The saved men are divided here by Paul into spiritual and carnal. And to be carnal is to be a spiritual baby. Now in, in the Old Testament we have these things pictured I think. Um, first of all before they were redeemed Israel were in Egypt they were in bondage they were in the world so to speak this speaks of the natural man enslaved by the world before redemption and then they're redeemed by the blood of the lamb and they find themselves in the wilderness this is the carnal man this is where most Christians are today the carnal man they're in the wilderness all they're concerned about is food and comfort and they have no real joy in the Lord. It's all whining. It's all complaining. It's all Egypt was better. The food was better. We enjoyed the leeks and the garlands and onions. And that's the wilderness experience. That's where carnal Christians generally dwell. 
And I've said to you before, you know, that I might be a carnal Christian today and a spiritual Christian tomorrow. We tend to be a little bit up and down. What we're looking for, God helping us, is a constant, consistent experience. And if the Lord please, in the promised land, which is where the spiritual men are. So you have the natural, those before redemption, before the shedding of the blood in Egypt. You have the carnal, those that are saved by the blood. They're saved all right, but they're always whining. They're always thinking about themselves. There's no joy. They're in a wilderness experience. And then there are those that are across the Jordan, which speaks of crossing the Red Sea is death to the world. Crossing the Jordan is death to self. And those that have gone over the Jordan, they're the people who find out what the enemies, where the enemies are. Those are the people that know that warfare is a reality. Those are the people that are having to confront powers of darkness on a regular basis. Paul knew, understood and knew all about this, of course, writes about it in the sixth chapter of the Ephesians, where he talks about the powers of darkness, which we considered last night. Of course, there was a later experience. They came out of Egypt, they went through the wilderness, they, they found themselves in the promised land. And um, as I say, most Christians have got not the beginning of an idea what spiritual warfare is all about. And do I know about it? Only God knows. But the enemies are there in the promised land, there are giants there. And the more you are resolute and determined to go on with God and be faithful, you're more going to face giants. Um, but there is another experience later on in his experience they were taken captive into Babylon. Now that's apostasy. And again, many of the churches have gone into Babylon today. They're in an apostate place. They're worshipping in idols. It might be gold, it might be silver, it might be pop stars, whatever. And uh, the, they've lost their focus. They've lost the joy that they once knew. They've forgotten that they were brought out of Egypt and they've gone into bondage. Because of their sin, they've gone into bondage. And so that's another experience, sadly, for many today, Christians and churches. But I've said we're going to look at seven marks of spiritual babyhood. So we're looking at the identifying marks of a carnal Christian this morning. And uh, I'm not, I'm not char charging you, any of you with anything between you and the Lord, as it is between me and the Lord, how much of this applies to me. But the first thing about a carnal Christian is he, like a child, like a baby, he always wants his own way. Compare that with what Paul has to say in Philippians and the fourth chapter. Because Paul, of course, was a very mature believer, a remarkable believer, possibly and arguably the greatest Christian that ever lived. Which is why God chose him and God used him and God wrote most of the New Testament at his hand. But in Philippians chapter 4 verse 11, Paul says this, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. You see, this is a long way removed from the kind of attitude that they had in the wilderness. Verse 12, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. <coughs> Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Someone has said that success is getting what you want. Happiness is wanting what you get. And Paul was a happy failure. And uh, little children, you you know you've been in the you've been in the supermarket and you've seen the five year old man, man, I want a lollipop, crying the place down. And mother says, if you don't shut up, I'll smack your ear off. And he carries on, and she doesn't smack his ear off, which she ought to have done or kept her mouth shut and they moan and they moan and they moan the kids until in the end mother just can't stand it anymore that's about the little wretch a lollipop but this is immaturity always wanting what we want and crying when we don't get it and easily getting upset I said to the folks that were here last night now can I get the expression right again um, that cheerfulness is a mark of wisdom I mean, that's something to take away for the start. Constant cheerfulness is a mark of wisdom. If we're gloomy, if we're whining like they were, if we're always complaining because we haven't got what we want like they were in the wilderness, that's foolishness, that's carnality. Paul was a wise man. He wanted what he got. He didn't want what he couldn't get. He was happy with what he got. He, was good. he had learned to be content. And that's a great secret of Christian joy is to learn to accept where we are at this moment with the Lord 
what he's given us today to receive not just the blessings but the trials from the hand of God and thank him, thanking him for them and if we are resolved that we want to go in with the Lord I'm sorry to tell you we're probably going to have trials because we learn in trials you learn far more in the valley than you do on the hilltop and some of us have had maybe all of us for all I know I know some of us have had serious trials over the last few years very very trying times indeed but you learn more there than you will when the sun's shining and that's where really the challenge comes to be cheerful when I was going through a particular trial in 2010 what bothered me most was I tended to whine about the trial I, I felt like I was managing to bear up through it but I realized I was whining too much and God not only expects us to bear the trial he expects us to bear the trial cheerfully and if you know that his hand is in control in all situations you can do that you know the world looks at the cross as I was thinking in my prayer this morning the world looks at the cross and they see failure and it looks like failure but it wasn't the greatest victory the world has ever seen the greatest demonstration of power Amen. that the world has ever seen and sometimes when you are down and you're on your face you're probably in the best place you could possibly be but we don't like it and we don't thank God for it so we want to get out of it quick Paul and Silas sang praises to God at midnight no it wasn't like the modern prisons you know they didn't get three square meals a day and a TV set and a ping pong room and all the rest of it they were probably chained to the wall they had their backs lashed open there was probably blood all over the floor they prayed and sang praises to God at midnight and the place shook they were not, Paul was not just content he was happy even in trials so one of the marks of carnality is that we're easily upset and we get gripey when things are not going our own way another mark of carnality and it was something that Paul points out here is that babies can't learn difficult lessons and we live in a time you know the Bible in many respects is not an easy book uh, Peter writes about Paul's letters that there are many difficult things to be understood which the foolish and unlearned rest to their own destruction if I want a cup of coffee when I get home I, go, I don't have to get coffee beans and grind them and all the rest of it I just go and get the instant coffee out of the cupboard and it's done and we want everything like that now but spiritual maturity doesn't come that way there has to be work there has to be labor there has to be some effort and you'll never I mean none of us will ever master the Bible that's for sure but understanding will only grow if you put some effort in take some time to study and compare scripture with scripture there's a temptation particularly for new believers to suppose that the Bible must be dead easy at first reading and you soon learn that the more you study the more complicated it gets but the more blessed it gets at the same time you see wonderful things and then whoa another problem comes up how do I understand this one so you pray about that and you compare scripture with scripture and God gives you life on it and then all of a sudden but what about this and for every question you answer you seem to get two more but nevertheless you know it, it's a precious thing to study and children have to have their ABC they have to, they, you've got to keep it simple all the time and that's the way they like it in most churches don't preach the Bible to us preach John 3.16 to us we had that last week and the week before and we hope to have it today and we hope to have it next week they just want the simple stuff all the time they just want milk now of course John 3.16 is, is not just milk it's meat, it's precious but nevertheless you know most people just just don't want Bible study they want the same old thing over and over and I've told you before and I've been in churches where I think to myself why have you people come I'm giving Bible teaching and I can see in their faces that they'd rather be anywhere but in the church on the, on the, in the, why have you come I'm thinking to myself well that church is gone you know and most of those churches have gone because they were just going through the motions they were in a kind of a religious rut they felt they had to go every Sunday and they couldn't stand a minute of it most of them they were looking at their clocks by the time of it. I mean my preaching may be awful maybe that's the problem I, I, I don't think it's that awful though to be honest that somebody's got to be looking at the clock and I can see them looking at the clock I've been, I've been going 10 minutes and I said to the folks the other night I think it was Wednesday night you know folks I can see all your faces <laughs> folks think we can't see them you know when we preach it 
Like at one church I go to, I could see the woman. She didn't like me. I know she didn't like me. She never liked me. And every time I preach, I could see her hiding behind the head in front, so she didn't have to catch my eye. And I could see it all. You know, we could we could see how you get an idea what people feel about the ministry. And sadly, again today, you know, children cannot learn difficult lessons. You've got to keep going on the ABC all the time. And the ABC is good. And the best thing in the Bible is the gospel. But there are things, as Peter says, that are hard to be understood. And we need to grapple with them and we need to teach them and we need to seek to understand them. It might just be that you'll meet some smart atheist who really would like to know the truth, but he's got problems. Maybe. And maybe you could, you could provide an answer, but you, some of these clever guys, you won't provide answers if you're on the ABC all the time. Another thing about babies or little children is they're apt to quarrel. They like to fall out. I mean, Jean's always telling me about the kids, you know, coming and saying, he's done my pencil, she's done my ruler. And they're always falling out with one another. And of course, that, Paul mentions this here in verse 3, he says, For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are they not carnal, and walk as men? Interesting expression that, walk as men. As though, we're some, as though believers are something more than men, and in a sense we are, and that applies to the ladies too, in a sense we are, we're the sons of God. We are partakers of the divine nature. Don't ever say, I'm only flesh and blood, you're not. Not if you're a Christian. You're partaker of the divine nature. But these were walking as men, they, they were just falling out and arguing amongst themselves. It's a mark of immaturity. Some brother comes into the church and maybe speaks in tongues and the next week after the congregation's gone, they've set up a new place down the road. People just don't know how to be gracious, it seems to me, and don't know how to forgive and don't know how to be understanding. Some people complain that folks are all, always leaving their church. Well, maybe if they're a little bit more gracious, not so many, quite so many people would leave, perhaps. Another thing that marks a spiritual babyhood and again Paul touches upon this here is to be taken up with personalities Paul says in verse 5 who then is Paul and who is Apollos but ministers by whom you believe now if you just want to go back to the first chapter um, Paul's really commenting upon what he's already said in the opening chapter here at verse 10 of chapter 1 now I beseech you brethren by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I have Apollos, and I have Cephas, and I have Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were ye baptised in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptised none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptised in my own name. And I baptised also the house of Stephanus, besides I know not whether I baptised any other. So they were falling, they'd got their favourite preachers. And maybe there was just something about each preacher that, 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 that they particularly liked. He's such a, he, he, his rhetoric's tremendous. Or maybe he's such a clever man. Or maybe he's got such a gentle way with him. Or, and, and they were kind of falling into camps that got their favourites. And over the years, you've heard them and I've heard them, you know, we've heard preachers who thunder, and sometimes that's okay, and you've heard preachers and they're just so quiet. But the important thing is, what about the message? It's Christ that's the message. Now it's true that, you know, some people, are, some preachers are better than others, but really, what's the message? You know, the poorest of preachers, if God, if God helps him, can preach Christ. And that's, that's important. And uh, I, I personally think, you know, there's no harm in saying such and such a man is a good preacher. As long as we don't fall out with anybody over it. You know, I sometimes will recommend, as I did this last week to Derek, recommend this guy and that guy. And, that, and you know, and there's some will say it's worth listening to this man. This one's not so much worth listening to, maybe. Um... But the important thing is, even the man that doesn't seem to be much worth listening to, is he preaching Christ? That's the critical thing. And certainly let's not fall out over it. I think this is what gives rise to denominations as well. Certain slants, certain lines of thought that maybe fall within the, the overarching, what shall we say, orthodoxy. 
but nevertheless they're overemphasized. I, um, I'm just trying to remember quite what it was that Pat said to me now, Pat Curry many years ago. I remember he mentioned three E's. Uh, he, I think he said something like, men begin with enlightenment. They get, a, they get light on something new. He says that if they're not careful, they exaggerate. And if that's not stopped, they go into error. And of course that, that can happen. Another mark of spiritual babyhood is they, the, the carnal man plays while big things are happening, like a child with its toys. He plays, he knows nothing about it. That's mum and dad's responsibility. And it's okay for a child, you know, it's okay for someone that's five or six or seven maybe. But when you're 18, 19, 20, 21, you, learn, you should have learned to put away childish things. And yet there are some Christians that just want to play all the time. And they can't take responsibility and they can't be given responsibility because they just want, they've got saved and now they want to have some fun. As Dr. Tozer once said, I found Jesus, let's have some fun. And uh, there, are, there are things to do for the Lord. Now as I say, if, you, if a child is a child, I wouldn't expect, you know, I'm not going to consult with Eden when the meeting's over as to when we should have our next trip to London. She's a little baby girl and, you know, it's great to watch them play and it's, in many respects it's encouraging to us sometimes. You can be so bound up with responsibilities, it's good sometimes to watch the simple lives of children. I need to distinguish it, I think, as well between spiritual maturity and physical maturity. You know, if, if a man gets saved in his 60s, he's not necessarily going to be spiritually mature. He'll probably learn quicker because of his natural years than somebody who gets saved at 15. But he's still a baby in Christ. But when you meet somebody, and I've met lots of them, they've been in the church, and, and a reasonably, reasonably sound Bible-preaching church for 40 years, and they're still babies, something's wrong. And I've met them often. They can't stand Bible teaching, some of these people. Just, all they can have is you just got to give them milk all the time. And uh, it's not, these are not days for us, if we're mature, these are not days for us to be playing in. These are days of us for us to be taking some responsibility and asking, Lord, what can I do for you? How can I build the church? Not necessarily just the local church, but the broader church, the, the, the body of Christ. What can I do, Lord? And yet a child will just play. Another thing that marks spiritual babyhood is a child has no proper, proper sense of values. You know, if you took a child into a, a, a china shop, you've got to keep hold of them, haven't you? Because that might just knock the stuff all over the place. You know, when our grandchildren were very small and they used to come around, they used to get all jeans valuables and you'd be going, whoa, and they'd be throwing them over the floor and all that, and some of them would get broken. Because a child doesn't have a sense of what's valuable and what isn't. A child will prefer the TV to the AV, as I often used to say. A, pot, a child will be more concerned because its values, I'm talking about a, a, a carnal Christian now, more concerned about the things of earth than the things of heaven. More concerned about his own or her own comforts and pleasures rather than what pleases the Lord. No proper sense of values. And finally, we're going to be brief this morning, finally, a child will frequently say the wrong thing. Uh, my, my grandchildren, when they were very small, have said some pretty shocking things. And Mike's had to pull them aside and say, you shouldn't say that. Because children just sign, just sign, say the first thing that comes into their that we as adults know that's not a very smart thing, that's not a very kind thing to say. And children can be brutal, absolutely brutal. Now by the time you get a bit older, you should learn a bit of grace and a bit of understanding, especially if you're a Christian. But again, baby Christians are often brutal and unkind and hypocritical and nasty and it's not necessary, it's childish. And sometimes you'll notice I say immaturity frequently says the wrong thing. You might be discussing something maybe, a group of you, something out of the scriptures 
and somebody will say something really and you think and I think to myself can that really come out of the mouth of a saved man is that is that really what a saved man would say a man for example a preacher for example who says he prays that all gays will go to hell really a man who says that Barack Obama should go to hell he prays that Barack Obama I've got a man in mind in particular really that's that's childish that's that's certainly saying the wrong thing a man that rejoices over death when say Muslims blow themselves up or the jihadis blow themselves up we don't, it's terrible we don't rejoice over that it's such a tragedy that we have these maniacal Islamists as I think we should call them who uh, rejoice in shedding blood they need to understand that they're going to pay in spades for every life they take because God is just it's, a, it's remarkable that they talk about Allah the just and Allah the merciful these same people and cut people's head off at the drop of a hat but they'll answer for every one of those we don't have to worry about justice but I'm digressing slightly let's just recap briefly then Mark's a spiritual babyhood a baby always wants its own way a child will always <coughs> want its own way and cry if it can't get it can't learn difficult lessons always wants the Bible ABC wants an easy translation <laughs> I can't understand it, get me something easy to read. I was at a big shot the other day, uh, an Anglican big shot, he's got a purple shirt, you know, one of those guys. I don't know whether he's a, de- or what he is, a bishop or what he is. And very clever, you know, and he's one of the leading lights in the Anglican movement. And uh, he starts to quote the Bible, and goodness knows what kind of Bible he's reading from. I haven't got a clue, but they put it up on the screen. It's clearly a modern Bible. And he's not even, he's making it up as he goes along, he's t- picking words out. I thought to myself, some reverence you've got for the Holy Scriptures and you're the leader in the Church of England? Children are apt to quarrel. I mean, how many times as parents do you have to separate the kids? You know, how many times have you got to pull Reuben off Caleb? How many times you know, do the, does one son or one daughter come and say, he's my so-and-so, and you've got to try and sort them out? It's all right, boys, I'm not knocking you. It's perfectly natural for boys, OK? Um... But, you know, in the church, among adults, should we behave like that? Taken up with personalities, always got a favourite preacher maybe, or a favourite doctrine. Plays while big things are happening. It's okay if you're seven. But if you've been seven years in the faith, maybe by now you should have started growing up. Has no proper sense of values. I think that's such an important thing really you know to to have an eye always to have an eye toward heaven always to have an eye towards the beamer seat to understand that one day we believers we're going to stand before the Lord of glory I'm looking forward to it I'm so looking forward to it but I know it's going to be a humbling experience but you know some preachers say that when you're judged everybody will be looking on I really don't think that's the case I think it'll just be me and Jesus you can challenge me over this you're welcome to and I'm, I mean even though he's going to say to me Colin you shouldn't have said that and you shouldn't have done that and look at that and I'm going oh no oh no yes Lord but just to be with the Lord will be a wonderful thing and we need to have that sense that we're going to one day we're going to be judged for what we're doing today Paul warns about those that are going through by the skin of their teeth talks about those that are building with wood hay and stubble and those are building with gold silver and precious stones what are we what are we building with this morning are we building anything or are we playing and then finally you know the immature will often say the wrong thing and oftentimes something caustic something unnecessary you probably heard the old the old guidance you know if you if you want to say something about somebody you should ask yourself three questions is it necessary is it true or perhaps put it in this order is it true is it kind and is it necessary <coughs> and if you can't say yes to all those you ought to shut up just keep quiet love covers a multitude of sins some preachers pride themselves on bawling everybody out and finding fault with this preacher and that preacher love covers a multitude of sins is it true is it necessary and is it kind
We'll leave you there this morning. Amen.